Um, hello, I am Jennifer Reynolds. I'm the Associate Dean of Faculty Research and Programs at the University of Oregon School of Law. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our inaugural Oregon Law Perspectives webinar. The Oregon Law Perspectives series will bring the work of our law school's faculty to our colleagues, our students, our alumni, and the broader public. Today, we are joined by a team of incredible researchers doing ambitious and important work. They will be discussing wicked water problems in the Willamette River Basin, with special focus on how interdisciplinary teams tackle these kinds of challenging and complex environmental issues. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce the team and our MC, and then let them take it away. So uh, first we are joined by our own Professor Adele Amos. Professor Amos teaches water law and admin law, and she has extensive experience in government. Next, we have Dr. Ann Nolan, professor in the geography department at the University of Nevada, Nevada, Reno. Dr. Nolan serves as the director of the graduate program of hydrologic sciences, and her research focuses on the interactions of climate with mountain snowpacks um, and glaciers and mountains as social social ecological systems. Uh, next is Chad Higgins, Associate Professor of Biological and Ecological Engineering at Oregon State University. His research focuses among other things on water vapor and atmospheric structure. Next is David Roop, Assistant Professor at Oregon State. He is a hydrologist who works on climate change and water resources. We also have Majdi Abu Najem, an associate professor at the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences at the University of California at Davis. He and Professor Higgins have been working on agrovoltaics, um, which, is, which helps explore how growers can conserve their local groundwater by shading a portion of their plants with photo photovoltaic panels. Uh, finally, we will be joined, she's not here yet, but she's coming, by Rosa Kapari, who's a PhD student at the University of North Carolina. She is an experienced research analyst with a demonstrated history of working in the water resources, in water resources and energy. Our MC and moderator for today's event is Heather Brinton, the director of the University of Oregon School of Law's uh, in nationally ranked Environmental and Natural Resources Center. She will be corralling the panelists and managing the questions. So if you have a question, you should feel free to submit it through the Q&A. At the bottom there, you'll see that there's a Q&A button. The chat doesn't work, so we'll be using the Q&A. Um, you can click on it whenever you have a question. You can enter in your question. There's an option to make your question anonymous if you like, and only Heather and the other panelists are gonna be able to see these questions. So please feel free to ask the questions and we will get them hopefully answered um, at some point during, during the webinar. Thanks so much to all of you for joining us today. And thank you so much to our wonderful panel and Heather. Please go ahead. OK, I think Adele's going to go ahead and next. Yes. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, uh, I am just going to kick us off by um, saying that this work about 10 years ago, I started, I shifted all of my own research into these interdisciplinary spaces and started working with um, some of the people that are on this webinar today and others on these pretty complex, wicked um, uh, research questions and problems. And it's been the most fulfilling work I've done in my career. It's been the hardest. Um, and it's very challenging, which you'll hear some of that today, but it also feels very purposeful and directed at um, needs in the community and, and trying to get at really complex problems. Um, so welcome. I'm going to kick it over to our, our lead PI, um, Dr. Chad Higgins, and I'm going to start the slideshow. We'll see if I can pull this off. Chad, I'll pass it to you. Thanks, Adele. Um, I, I have a... a a simple and difficult task to, to get us through today, and it's really to introduce the concept of uh, the nexus of energy, water, and food systems, and how we're um, using convergent research to, to attack those problems. So the basic premise behind what we do is that everything is connected to everything else. That is that you can't um, get water to a town without pumping it, and that takes energy. 
Um, you can't create energy from a thermonuclear plant without cooling it, and that takes water. Um, out in the American West, you really can't irrigate your crops or grow crops um, without irrigation. And you know you can use food as a as a fuel in and of itself. And and those are just the high level connections of the system of systems or the the meta system that we call the energy water food nexus. And um, I'm gonna just just give you an allegory here uh, because the approach sort of mirrors the problem. And, and that is, you would think that there, there might exist a central authority that controls disparate units, each having their own part, that the timing works, and that the entire thing is greater than the sum of its parts, um, that it finishes in an appropriate time, it follows a pace and a, and a script, and everyone follows the written documents that guide the whole process. Um, that's not true at all. In, in fact, it's more like um, if there were three symphony orchestras or more, all playing at the same time, all playing different pieces and trying to make something sound uh, good uh, after, after all is said and done. And in some ways, the convergent research is, is the same as the energy water food system. Everything is interconnected. We all have to talk the same language, which we don't. Um, we all have to work to a same schedule, which we don't. We, we all have to have general knowledge of, of everybody else so we, can, so we can work together, but we all have to play our special, specialized part. So um, I see the, the, the challenges and, and the opportunities within the scope of research in the field are the same as the challenges and opportunities of doing this, this type of research. That is the the, uh, the reward and the complexity of the research is reflected in, um, in the team that we have. And, and I think that's really why it's, it's so uh, rewarding to, to work in this, in this field. So, so this is actually how it works. Now, I don't have time to discuss, discuss this diagram, but this is our um, most simplified conceptual representation of the energy water food nexus. Um, Maji and I just published this in the sustainability journal um, not too long ago. And suffice to say, it, it, it essentially um, breaks the world into layers. And, and those are the, the, the gray layers behind everything. Um, and you see the law is in the third layer from the bottom. And that is everything that can't be controlled by law is below it. And everything that can is, is above it. So I can't submit a prayer of relief to the deer that eat my uh, roses, right? That's a process below the law layer. That's in the ecosystem and climate layer. However, the law does affect policy management, um, the economy and populations, everything that sits above it. Within each layer, there are processes, processes that must occur in the meta system so that we can extract those resources from the environment that we need to survive, food, water, and energy. And each is guided and, and influenced by something behind it, those gray areas. Connections are shown by the colors. Green is food, um, blue is water, red is um, energy. Apologies to colorblind folks. Um, that's insensitive of me, but it was the, the most logical color schema for that. Black is carbon. And what you see and what comes out naturally is water is the great integrating force. It is the thing that connects most things. It is the thing that connects most processes. It is the most indispensable element and its physical tendrils mimic, I think some of the law tendrils that, 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 are, that are attached. When, when, I, when I started with Adele, she kind of panicked. Um, I, I don't wanna give, give away the goose Adele, but you, you kind of panic because notice that the law layer is everywhere on every intersection. Right, and um, she she was really you know really stuck to her guns and was like, Chad, I'm only going to do this. I'm a water I'm a water expert. I'm going to do the water. I'm going to do the water. I'm not going to get sucked into the rest of it. Um, so what I take from that is that yes, we all have our specialty, but I need more lawyers. Right, there's law everywhere. So um, and and conflicting laws, and we can get into that. Um, and Adele also is far better speaking about law than I am. Um, 
but but I find it fascinating that the natural environment, the political environment, the law environment, and the sociological environment are all mixed up in, in a complicated, I call this spaghetti cake. I call this the spaghetti diagram. And it's just, it's not untangleable. You know, you cannot untangle it um, because it's connected in the way it's connected. So um, happy to, uh, entertain questions or deeper conversation about what what is the uh, what are the physical and, and actual relationships that are represented in these diagrams but uh, but I'm gonna let the team speak more to the detail so I think I'm at my five minutes I'm gonna hand it off to Anne next <laughs> great hi everybody thanks for coming so Chad, explained the food energy water nexus system with that beautiful spaghetti diagram. I'm gonna be talking more about water scarcity and this concept of wicked water. I wanna start by addressing, a, by providing a definition of water scarcity, which is different from the concept of water deficit. Water scarcity is uh, fundamentally a normative concept an anthropogenic concept in that it's all about the human wants and needs, the ability to meet uh, enough water, the, the um, water at the right time, not too much. We don't want floods, we don't want droughts in the right place. You know, you don't want it in your basement, but you still want it coming through your pipes. Um, you want it to stay perhaps within the banks of the river, for instance, um, the right quality of water. And most importantly, and this uh, corresponds to the law aspect, is you want to have access to that water, um, perhaps legal access or other forms of access, logistical access, for instance. And so again, these are fundamentally, this is fundamentally a human construct. And so water scarcity is what we're, what I'm thinking about in, when I'm talking about water. And um, you can read more about this definition in great detail in a paper um, by Bill Jager and others. This was the first paper that came out of our Willamette Water 2100 project. And what we found there was that water scarcity really varies a lot in the Pacific Northwest um, in the Willamette River Basin. Even though we have uh, a region of great abundance of water, it varies a lot by location, by time, by all the different uses and um, they're valued either directly or indirectly by society. And that um, it needs to be distinguished fundamentally from water deficit, which is you know, not having enough water in an ecosystem for that ecosystem to function in a way that it has functioned in its sustainable sense perhaps. Um, but a deficit doesn't involve people at all. That um, the value of water is fundamentally that humans um, define. And it doesn't necessarily mean water itself. It can be like the indirect water. We value uh, healthy fisheries. Uh, we value anadromous fish, salmon and, and bull trout, for instance. Um, and therefore we have environmental flows that we value. But moving on from this idea of scarcity or water security is something called uh, wicked water. And those of you who are familiar with the concept of wicked problems are these are problems that are um, really difficult to define, that they um, they don't have a permanent solution. They in fact might not have any sort of solution. That the solutions to uh, problems that are these really really complex problems aren't true or false. They might be considered good or bad, but they might just be considered the best solutions, solutions in air quotes, that can be achieved at any particular time. And the concept of wickedness isn't a moral concept, but it's a, um, it's a social environmental systems approach, a, a way of thinking, and sometimes it's referred to as diabolical, in that wicked problems resist the um, usual, the traditional ways of trying to solve them. Um, because they're out of the box, they're so complex, and they often also involve incomplete knowledge. So when we're thinking about water, how do we, how do you think about wicked water? And so one of the 
um, things that we've been working on in our food energy water nexus system project is this relationship that that Chad outlined of water trade-offs with energy and food. Um, you have you know water in its direct sense and you have water in its indirect sense and in that it's contained in other processes or, or responsible for other processes. So when we're trying to formulate solutions to who gets this water, who has legal access to it. If you have legal access, do you, can you actually build the infrastructure to convey it to where you need it? Um, what happens if you have too much of it? There are a lot of possible pathways to solutions. And um, these might be hard solutions like infrastructure or soft solutions like collaborative governance or additional regulations. There are a variety of different outcomes and states that are highly contested um, by the wide range of stakeholders that are engaged. We have conflicted interests then among these stakeholders that are fundamental uh, conflicts. Um, and again, these result in seemingly intractable trade-offs. Sometimes it can be really creative. Sometimes you have a trade-off that works, but then you throw in climate change and it doesn't anymore. But overlaying all of this, and part of the reason for this project is because we often have incomplete data and an incomplete understanding of how the system works. And so that generates a substantial amount of uncertainty around the consequences of possible actions that we can take. And so what we need is data and evidence to make these decisions, but not just that data, data information or evidence, but data information and evidence that is reliable, salient, um, and sufficiently complete that where uncertainties are at a, at a level where people agree, it's like, these are good data, this is valuable information, we have enough evidence to make a good decision here. So the degree of wickedness of a problem could be contained in those six dimensions of possible pathways, values of different outcomes and states of the world, conflicted interests among stakeholders, seemingly intractable tra trade-offs, incomplete data or disputes um, over data information and evidence, and, and uncertainty about the consequences of, of possible actions. If we can, and we think we can, quantify each of these six components, we could come up with a six-dimensional uh, definition or metric index, a wicked water index, and this is something that's um, a work in progress, um, to characterize the degree of wickedness. And that might be important because as we're attempting to address these issues, I think it would be really helpful for stakeholders and decision makers and management to have a sense of the whole system and the different degrees of wickedness when it comes to understanding the whole system or parts of the system. That way, um, this metric, this measure um, could, could tell us the degree to which societal change has to occur in order to achieve an equitable solution. Because wickedness is always embedded within a societal, within a social environmental system. They don't just stand out there on their own. They aren't just environmental or just societal. They're fundamentally part of an SES. And the other part is you might think about, well, um, we can think about the degree to which societal change must occur, but we can also think about how, how much, how, what is the value of the resources that we have to throw at that wicked water problem in order to make some headway that's important in the most equitable way possible. So I'm gonna stop there and hand it off to Majdi. Uh, thank you, Anand Chad. And uh, uh, if, if you have already agreed that the uh, water problem in itself and alone is a wicked problem, I'm, I'm here to show you how the wickedness actually go exponentially higher as we try to incorporate energy and food system to it. So uh, starting with the spaghetti diagram that uh, Chad and I published, and I like the I like Chad's more uh, extended name to this diagram. He calls it the, the wedding cake with spaghetti on top diagram. Uh, but starting with this diagram, uh, Chad and I uh, started an attempt to uh, abstract and simplify the problem at a single node. And, and we tried to see uh, whether there is a possibility or a chance to, uh, to abstract this into a standardized organizing principle in a way to, to simplify uh, the mathematics of, of a problem uh, like this. 
Uh, and we ended up with this diagram at the bottom on the, on the left corner of this slide, uh, where you can see all those arrows and equations coming and, and contributing into one single node on, on, on the uh, spaghetti diagram that, uh, that Chad uh, introduced. So you can see how complex this uh, problem is. And then uh, my, my group started to look at what are the different resources required for a single society? And, and we chose a generic society that you can see uh, in the middle of the uh, right, right diagram. Uh, so you see those homes and uh, to, to, to ensure a resilient and a sustainable living for such a society, we need to ensure that water, food and energy resources are provided to them. So, uh, this becomes a very complex problem because given the society's uh, preferences and culture and, uh, and geographic uh, extent and location, there are different food items and food products that are there. So food preference was there. And then we started working on optimizing what would be a, uh, a nutritious balanced diet for to ensuring a food security of, of a community like this and what are the requirements. So moving from food up in this figure into what area of land is needed and what agricultural practices and what technologies are there are needed in terms of cropping, in terms of agriculture, and in terms of uh, livestock. Uh, this creates its own dynamics at the level of biogeochemical cycles, carbon and nitrogen interactions, and how the carbon and nitrogen cycles interact. On, on the right of this very uh, diagram, you look at energy and how energy is also competing over land and over resources. Uh, and depending on what technologies we are, we're adopting, you have a food footprint, a land, a, uh, a land footprint, a, uh, a carbon footprint, and a water footprint to each one of those. And then integrating this with, with the complexity of, of water resources, there are different sources, different qualities, different locations. All this integrates together when we want to uh, answer to a certain policy. So uh, we're talking here about interactions between water, energy, and food at the different spaghetti and, 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 and wedding cake layers that Chad earlier defined. Uh, and you can see all those arrows and the change in one arrow would have a major impact on, on each and every component within this diagram. So. Uh, we all like to solve simpler problems, like what is an optimum water policy for a community? And I used the word simple here, fun intended, because this is already a wicked problem. Uh, uh, and then have another group work on one optimum energy policy, and the third one work on agricultural and food policy. But implicitly, in each attempt, each group is actually making a decision that impacts the two other groups. And uh, having this in comparison to what would be an optimum nexus policy for a community and what are the other dimensions that incorporate into it would, would actually uh, attend more into uh, the, the real needs and, and the real changes. Because implicitly, if you're only focusing on water, any policy that you're coming up with is going to impact energy and, and food, whether this is part of the problem definition or not. Uh, so. Uh, it's, it's up to, to the decision-making policy to think whether we want to implicitly or explicitly attend to all of those because any decision made at any level from those is uh, going to, to impact the whole spaghetti diagram. Uh, I'm going to stop at this and we'll uh, hand it to my colleague, David Roop. Thank you, Majdi. Um, so, as we think of ways to increase food, energy, and water security in the Willamette Basin, we would certainly be remiss not to consider the effects of, of the changing climate, which add another level of uncertainty to the, the wicked problems. For example, why would we, you know, when we're thinking about how to manage forests to increase the snowpack to increase water security, um, you know, are we really, are we really going to do that where, where the, we don't really expect the snow to occur anymore in the future? Um, so I'm going to spend a few minutes here discussing some challenges when considering climate change in a project like ours that is already exploring multiple questions and hypotheses. And I wanted to make two major points. Point number one, 
the range of plausible changes in climate in our basin is really quite large. We, it, over the next 50 years forward, we may experience mild warming up to having individual years where the annual temperature is nearly 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the average temperature of, of the past. So this would be a temperature that would be really five times higher than what natural var variability would deliver and would fundamentally alter our basin's ecosystems. Um, so despite advances in climate science and modeling over the last 15 years, we've really not been able to significantly narrow this range of plausible futures in climate or comfortably eliminate the more extreme changes. And there's a, a few re reasons for this. Uh, the, the key reason has to do with human behavior. So the future climate really depends on our future emissions of greenhouse gases. Um, now a wide range of plausible scenarios of future emissions have been developed by experts. Um, behind these scenarios are assumptions of birth rates and death rates and um, economic growth per capita energy consumption, and energy use efficiency, efficiency, the future portfolio of our energy sources, technological advancements and, and a, a level of global coordination or fragmentation on, the, on sort of the national level. Um, and we really have no good way to assign likelihoods to, to these um, emission scenarios. The second and third reason has to do with our understanding or imperfect understanding of the climate system. We don't know precisely how emissions today get converted to concentration into the atmosphere tomorrow. Um, and second, we don't really have a, we don't know exactly what the planet's climate sensitivity is. And by climate sensitivity, I mean, how much will the planet's surface warm given a given increase in greenhouse gas concentrations? So even if we knew precisely what our future emissions would be, somehow magically, we would still be faced with a sizable degree of uncertainty in what the, the global temperature change would be over the next 50 years, really by the end of the century. That's point number one. Uh, point number two is, you know, the climate of our basin is not just temperature. Uh, we're faced with uh, also ranges of plausible changes in humidity, winds, uh, and precipitation. And changes in precipitation, like rainfall, may occur um, in, in the form of a changes in intensity, magnitude, duration, um, and timing. Um, and maybe more importantly, global warming is expected to impact or affect the frequency and magnitude of these rare extreme events that can disrupt our food, energy, and water system. So um, we may expect under the influence of a warmer climate, events like the 1996 Willamette floods, um, or even the severe weather, we, the really severe weather, fire weather we had less of, last September to become more severe as the planet warms. Um, but these events are rare, right? And they may or may not occur again in the, in the next 50 years, which is our, really our, time, our horizon for our project. Um, so in a project that already has multiple questions and hypotheses, and, really resource constraints make it not feasible for us to adequately sample this broad multidimensional space of plausible climate futures. Um, we just, we just don't, you know, we don't have that luxury. So the question I face is then how do we proceed? Um, do we do what I call the best guess? So we adopt some best guess, which might be some middle of the road or business as usual scenario of climate over the next 50 years from the many scenarios we have available to choose from. Now, when we do this, we may, we may miss some very interesting disruptive events that don't appear in those scenarios. Um, so then another approach might be to do a stress test. So let's not concern ourselves so much with defining the exact climate and weather of the next 50 years, um, but instead look at what, really, what it really takes to stress our food, energy, water systems in the, in the basin by subjecting them to a sampling of the types of extreme weather events that climate models suggest may become more frequent or more, uh, more severe in the future. Um, I'm not um, providing the answer today. I'm just posing the question because I think it's an interesting one of how we deal with an uncertain future climate. So I'm going to I'm going to end it there. I'm going to hand it over to Rosa. Thanks, David. Well, oh. Oh no. Um, 
So I apologize, first of all, for being late. And then I think my unanimated slide didn't get to Adele. So I apologize for the messy slide. Um, but really what I wanted to talk to you all about is the work that the teams on the East Coast. So UNC and North Carolina State University led by doctors Greg Trackless and Jordan Kern do, which is looking at the problems, many of which you've heard today and the systems involved. And I'm trying to take a bit of a more macro view to the what I would split into three systems. So the natural, the engineered, and the financial. So you've heard a lot about the natural system, weather variability and how that translates to in the Pacific Northwest, a stream flow variability. That's a key variable that my group is particularly interested in. But of course, we also have an engineered system that we humans have built on top of the natural system in order to try to manage some of that variability, whether that's for food production, like Manji and Chad have hinted at, whether that's managing water supplies for the systems of dams and reservoirs. But we also have a pretty complex financial system on top of those two combined into which a lot of the impacts of weather variability and uncertainty, and then either the success or the failures of our engineered system to manage that uncertainty and variability, uh, those get translated to net revenues, costs, damages. And you have the perfect case study in the Pacific Northwest with the Bonneville Power Administration. And that's where really a lot of the work at UNC and North Carolina State uh, focuses because BPA, as I'm sure many of you know, is really dependent on streamflow, which is part of the wicked water issue in terms of supply and really knowing how to manage that, but brings together a lot of variables. So we've got the natural variability, we've got our systems of very extensive system of dams and reservoirs that we've built on top of that to manage that and create reservoirs for recreation, some water supply, but also largely for hydropower. And then we have the financial metrics that BPA is dependent on as an entity. And so their stream flows are really, uh, sorry, stream flows in the Columbia River are really closely linked to their net revenues. And that's a really strong relationship and one that's led them to be downgraded just in the past year by one of the major credit ratings agencies. And so the case of BPA just highlights how interconnected not only our food, energy, and water, but also the systems that we humans have imposed on them. And I think there are a few questions in the chat talking about how wicked water is just a human construct and how we are really the core of the wickedness. And that's absolutely true. And what I also want to touch on is how we go from all of these problems and issues and translate them into solutions. And so what you see in the gray box and the green boxes are sort of how we've addressed different types or different aspects of water and weather variability. And the same way that we have often siloed the problem to maybe just an engineering issue or maybe just, oh, this is a water issue. We have big storms, let's build a big levee, a big sand dune. We've siloed also the solutions. And so there's not a lot of solutions that take into account all of the different faces of wicked water, just wicked issues in general. And so risk reduction is one of the broad umbrella categories that we've often used. So that just means reducing your exposure to a hazard or making yourself less vulnerable. We've traditionally done this with large infrastructure projects. So we think we're gonna get more droughts. So let's just big a bigger dam. If we save more water, then we'll have everyone we need it. But I think we all know that that comes with a lot of costs and not just upfront in terms of capital expenditure, but also environmental costs. And again, those unintended consequences that we don't necessarily include in our initial assessment. And so some of the better tools start to look away from risk reduction and think about risk management and perhaps the financial terms. So how do we maybe focus less on big infrastructure and taking ourselves out of the exposure, but mitigating the harm that it can do? And so there are some traditional tools that retain that risk and try to just, you know, store up enough money for that rainy day, a savings account reserve fund. But 
as David mentioned, we don't know what sorts of weather events and what sorts of extremes we're going to be facing in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And so it's very hard to just save up enough money. And so another tool that we can also use and that we often focus on in our research is risk transfer. So many of you are probably familiar with this in terms of insurance and reinsurance, but we also look at a lot of weather-based instruments in co-fires. So how can we take advantage of the fact that natural variability translates to financial impacts? And you can't see this figure, but we can look at BPA again as a case study and consider that because their net revenues are so dependent on stream flows, what if we designed insurance that paid out when stream flows were low? And that maybe decreases their average net revenues because they're paying some sort of premium for this, but it reduces a lot of their financial risk. It doesn't eliminate the natural variability. So you still have years of low and high stream flows, but it helps them to manage that without necessarily tying them into a big infrastructure project or a long-term fixed um, contract of sorts, but something that's more flexible, that is adjustable and adaptable to change as we learn more about how our wicked water issues are shaping up. And so with that, I'll pass it back on to Adele and the role of law in all of this. Hello, it's really fun for me to hear everybody's presentations. That was really delightful. We don't do this enough, um, team. Uh, so um, the, the piece that uh, the legal team takes on in this modeling effort. So all of these areas feed into an effort to try to model future scenarios for the Willamette River Basin to look at these trade-offs and provide data and try to analyze um, and provide information about future conditions in the basin. Um, and as Chad noted, it this project freaked me out when it was first proposed because there's law and policy everywhere. Um, there's land use policy, there's food policy, there's food law, there's you know, the laws of land use, the laws around energy production and the BP, the laws that apply to BPA and the laws. And so um, I have a particular hypothesis under this grant that involves looking at um, the flow in the Willamette, particularly as it relates to um, state in-stream flow laws, which protects water in place, and the application of two federal statutes, primarily the Endangered Species Act, which governs the operation of all the reservoirs in the Willamette system, and also the um, Clean Water Act. Um, that applies in the Willamette system. Um, in addition, it wasn't a part of the original hypothesis, but it's become very clear in the last five years, the presence of unquantified um, time immemorial water rights on behalf of the indigenous peoples, particularly in the lower part of the Willamette as it reaches the Columbia, um, I think will have a very significant impact going forward on the main stem flow of the Willamette as well. So that's added to the the law and policy structure. But backing up away from the particular hypotheses that we work on, there is this idea of seeing, and I, I don't know how many law folks are on um, the webinar, but there is this idea of seeing the role that law can play in a project like this. Um, it is not typical that modeling efforts um, have had law and policy people um, included in them. And so it's it's been interesting for me to think about the contribution that folks who study the law can make to these kinds of efforts. And I really think it's in these four bullets, right? It really is this process of seeing the law as this proactive and active tool for thinking about the future rather than as a reactive thing, you know, call the lawyers once the car accident happens um, and figure out where the liability is. Call the lawyers after the flood happens and figure out who's responsible and who pays what damages. But instead this approach is, what if we included those with expertise about how this law and policy system works um, at the front end to try to think about possible solutions, identify hotspots, wicked problems, identify zones of conflict, and ask ourselves if law and policy as a proactive mechanism can do anything about that um, and help inform choices we might make. In addition, the law contains um, a lot of, and my team has heard me talk about this a lot, uh, my experience of non-law people is they think that law is rigid, that law is the law. And so the model would build the law around a set of boundaries. And any good lawyer knows 
that the law has all kinds of flexibility. It has inherent discretionary authority that agencies or decision makers may or may not for political reasons want to exercise. And so part of the fun of this project is thinking as we're building a, a model, what kinds of law and policy dials do we want to think about how agencies may in a hundred year future think about their discretionary authorities differently? And how might they exercise those authorities in a different way? And so lots of my work is associated around that. Um, and then with any of these areas, there's just the kind of descriptive work of understanding. I like to call it the law and policy ecosystem. You know, if I take my students out to the Willamette, when we can all be together and go to the Willamette, um, and I, I talk about how at any given moment, there's a flow um, there's a, there are a whole set of things. There's temperature, there's climactic conditions, there's a hydrologic story, there's a biotic story, there's an economic story for why that amount of water in that quality is at that spot in the river at any given moment. Um, you know, there are, are all kinds of explanations from other disciplines about how that happens at that moment. Well, there's a law and policy story too. Um, there's an ecosystem of laws and policies that have impacted that point in the river. And so all of those have status and interrelationships and sort of add to the wickedness of the problem. And then the hope, I guess the hope that I have in doing research like this is that it is responsive to needs of the community. There's a new, um, this book is out in the last couple of years about approaching research collaborations and letting needs of the community define in some ways the kinds of inquiry um, that we make. And the hope is that um, the law and policy work uh, allows us to help decision makers explore options that they have to act proactively, right? That we can identify um, management pathways that might avoid conflict, avoid devastating um, consequences, um, and that to reorient their missions a little bit to think about where they have this discretionary authority. So it ends up being, um, you know, the modeling can then be a tool to sort of have them think about the future and how they want to prepare um, for that future as decision makers. Uh, so it's really, I, I said at the beginning, it's been really meaningful work for me because it feels, while very technical and difficult, it also feels very applied when we have our meetings with our stakeholders. Um, it's very engaged and it and it feels very purposeful uh, and feels like the research and academic work that all of us are doing being tilted at a need in the community. Um, so I think that brings us to the end. Heather, I think I was going to turn it back over to you for questions for, for the panel. Yes, absolutely. First off, I just want to thank all the panelists for your brief presentations. It's been fascinating to hear all about all of your work and the work of this project. Um, Chad, getting back to your opening, um, you did a great job of framing really two big areas of issue and challenge in this type of work. And one is, you know, the, the creation of the interdisciplinary team and analysis and ability to work together with a common research purpose and what that looks like and how you do that. Um, and then relatedly, of course, equally challenging, mirroring, you said, um, actually creating the um, information and knowledge base that you need to address a very complicated or wicked problem. Um, and so, as you can imagine, some of our questions are lining up in one of those two areas. And, and so, the first one I thought I would ask for you, Chad, is just generally, um, what are the biggest challenges to creating the right team of interdisciplinary researchers? How do you figure out what disciplines need to be included? And how do you overcome uh, disciplinary boundaries with regards to understanding of knowledge, expertise, and so forth. And then specifically a little sub question for some of those of us in, your, in, in the audience, we'd really like to know. Um, having worked, I'm sure, in other interdisciplinary research teams that did not include a legal expert, what do you see as the pluses and maybe minuses of having legal experts particularly involved in this type of interdisciplinary research effort. Okay, there's there's a few to unpack there, but let's see if I can do it in, in order. Um, building a team. It's not easy. Um, it's 
really a, a, a social exercise to, to some degree. Um, I, I, I have my approach to it and, and I actually like to talk to the individual and get a sense for um, what their expertise is and um, what their threshold for um, humility is because those are two very important attributes you need for, for this type of work. So, um, so in fact, what, what happened? Um, proposal call comes out, ideas uh, are sparked from a conversation with, with one or, or more colleagues. And then you start asking the question, okay, if we really wanna tackle this wicked problem, do we need an economist? Do we need a sociologist? Should we get a philosopher? Do we need an anthropologist? Do we need a lawyer? And um, you go through the you go through that thought exercise, and part of the limitation of that exercise is your own limitation, right? You don't know what you don't know, and as you build the team, you continue to iterate until you exhaust the options. And that's not to say that you're ever perfect. In fact, I would argue that you'd never be perfect because there's never enough budget to support enough experts. And, and that's what happens, right? We run out of money before we run out of brain power. Um, and uh, that ends up being the ultimate limitation. In terms of how to overcome in, in how we talk to each other, um, that's where the hum humility comes in. And, um, and that's why it's a necessary component for, for this type of, of team research. There is a tendency and unnamed folks of un, un, unnamed professions to, if you have to get dedicated your entire life to one subject, to think that the approaches that you take in that subject are the approaches that must be taken everywhere. Um, and that is a narrow vision. And one must be humble enough to know that everybody else will have better ideas than you. Um, particularly in areas where you think you, you, you should be the expert. Someone may come at it from a sideways direction that you've never thought about and you, you have to be ready for that. And if you're not ready for that, um, you're gonna get blindsided and bowled over in this. There also is the act of humility in um, being curious about how people interact with each other. You know, um, when Adele says discretionary authority, I hear do whatever you want, right? Um, but that's not what it means. And, and we, have to, we have to come to a common understanding about what words mean, which, which is kind of a weird thing um, to think about, but it is the base layer. And, and that's, that's something that, that really requires people to think and, and be cognizant of, of other people and, and their expertise. Pluses and minuses of lawyers. Okay. Um, you know, I, it's, it's amazing what a, what a perspective that that brings. Um, in, and it's, you know, I have my own limitations in perspective. I'm an engineer as engineer. I come from an engineering background. I, I, that's, that's how I see the world and equations. And, um, and that has its positives, it has its negatives, and it has its limitations. And um, as you approach a problem, my tool set extends only so far. You know, I can talk about flow rates and, and atmospheric fluxes and, and um, you know, how fast uh, carbon is sequestered and, and that kind of things. But, but often the knob of control is in the law. And um, <laughs> I, I had this conversation once with, with somebody and they were coming slow to the realization that, you know, you should, you should actually understand people if you want to study people. And he's like, you know, this problem about food, it's really about people. And um, yeah, problems about people are about people. And people interact with food just as much as they interact with the law. And I think it's really a necessary component for these multi-integrative um, teams. And, you know, I, I don't think there's really a, a minus from it. Um, yeah, there, there, you, you've got to dedicate budget to to that, yes, that means you have to take it from somebody else. Um, it's a zero sum game in that way. But um, the perspective that it brings is, is really um, elucidating to how 
um, you might approach a problem because I might come up with a technical solution to something that is completely illegal. Um, in fact, I have. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and as fun as that is, um, we, we, we definitely are guided by a very orthogonal thought process to what we are traditionally um, trained as, as scientists. So, so yeah, um, you have to be ready to accept those viewpoints and, and then you have to, I hold myself to that as well. So, so, uh, you know, I, I don't. I, I don't know if I can roast you, Adele. We'll have to do that later. <laughs> All right. I think there's. I, I can name a downside, and then I'd okay. love to take it to Anne too to answer some of those questions about interdisciplinary teams because Anne and I have had some experiences outside of this interdisciplinary team <laughs> um, that are really interesting. But um, I think one of the downsides is you know um, we're trying to model a hundred years in the future, and we're trying to develop these scenarios and all these inputs and managing these inputs. And then, you know, litigation gets filed on the whole Willamette River and the operation of the whole reservoir system, which is like central to how our model works. And I start saying, whoa, 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 but depending on what happens in that biological opinion, that changes everything about every algorithm we have in. And everybody looks at me and says, so like, do we stop? <laughs> Like we have to keep modeling Adele. <laughs> so there are these ways in which, you know, you just have to keep a check on the legal content because it's worthwhile to look at the scenarios and figure out how to um, integrate and be responsible about the sort of legal and policy landscape that's playing itself out and let that inform the modeling effort, but not overwhelm it to the point that you, you are brought to a halt, I guess. I, I think that's a, you know, you have to, if you're the law and policy person doing that, it's important. I guess that's the humility you're talking about, Chad, that like what's happening in your discipline isn't the only thing that's driving the modeling effort. So, Anne, I'm gonna kick it to you like we talked about doing among ourselves as a panelist, unless Heather jumps in and... <laughs> well, Anne, I'd love to invite you to any other thoughts you have on that question. Sorry, were you asking me or somebody else? You. Me, okay, got it. <laughs> I wasn't sure what, what Heather was asking. Um, yeah, interdisciplinary uh, or transdisciplinary projects, right? So interdisciplinary is where the disciplines are interacting with each other within the academic realm or within our known realm of comfort. Transdisciplinary is going outside and engaging with stakeholders as opposed to outreach, which is like a kind of a one-dimensional thing. Engagement is like implies two, two directions. So um, that is absolutely essential for success of this kind of project where this, the, the step one is agree on the language. Like we had to write a paper on water scarcity so that we were all on the same page because we didn't know what we were talking about when we were talking about water scarcity. The economist said one thing and you know the ecologist said something, oh no, it's not this. And then once you have some sense of the language, you have to agree on what's most important because there are a lot of sort of fundamental components of the system that you have to get right before you can get into all the subtleties and all the quirkiness. But, you know, again, we have our pet things that we're really interested in and the budget has to follow the important things. And sometimes you have to write the budgets before you write, you know, when you're writing the proposal, but bef before you're actually like doing the work and the budgets are allocated and somebody gets their budget and they're like, what's mine is mine and what's yours could be mine too. Right, and that's not a good approach. That is not an approach that exemplifies the humility that's needed for this kind of project to work. I also wanna say that team building of this sort doesn't occur in a vacuum. It didn't just occur like, here's a team. We had um, probably five years of meetings and got to know each other around the table. A lot of us weren't, aren't even here anymore. Then we had a six year project called Willamette Water 2100. And then out of that came more questions, more, more um, need for different people. Uh, and then out of that was born the, the uh, Food Energy Water Nexus project that Chad is heading up now. And that has, has really transformed our way of thinking, but it didn't just sort of happen out of nothing. It, it was really started back in probably 2005 
when we started all of this. So a long time coming. And that's the important thing for transdisciplinary projects. They take time. And your funding horizon might just be five years. So you have to spend it very wisely and you have to do an enormous amount of prep. And I totally agree what Chad was saying about having the right people around the table. And there, I don't think there's any downside to having a water lawyer on the project, especially Adele, who's so great to work with, but Great, yeah. great, thank you, Anne. Sort of a related question is, I mean, a number of you really explained the uncertainty and incomplete knowledge um, that exists with regards to such wicked um, problems that you're addressing. And I'm curious as to whether or not how that interfaced with a multidisciplinary team who may have different knowledge bases and their own sense of what the certainty of knowledge is. And Dave, I thought maybe you could take that on. Did you say, did, sorry, did you say Dave? Yes. Um, yeah, so, you know, I'm the climate guy in, in the group and, and, um, you know, I have, I have my, I understand the uncertainties from, from my angle. And I look at a project like this, uh, where there's multiple questions and every question has its own uncertainty realm that it's working under. Uh, but I know mine, you know, and I look at, okay, if we really want to, if we really want to understand my uncertainty, how my uncertainties affect the, the answers. You know, we need to do A, B, C, and D, right? And, uh, but we can't, it's just not, I wanna run, I wanna run our model of the Willamette Basin, you know, a thousand times with a thousand different futures and then look at, you know, do some statistical analysis and see what's the probability of this happening and that happening. Um, that can't happen. It just, it, it's not gonna happen. So, and I'm sure everyone else in the team may, you know, on some level face that same, that uh, same conundrum, um, and I, you know, I don't have an answer for it, uh, but um, you know, maybe other people do. I, I, um, I hope I, I come out of this project with a, a better way of, oh, I don't know, of, of I guess, ex and I don't want to say accepting uncertainty because we do it all the time, but yes, um, yeah, I don't know where I'm going with this other than. Um, I, I, maybe someone can step in and bail me out here. <laughs> I really don't. Oh, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's, um, I don't know if we have the best tools yet to, to handle all the uncertainties that in a project like this that has so many different dimensions. Maybe Bruce, I can follow up a little bit on that. Well, uh, I kind of agree with David, basically, we can only run so many simulations and identify so many possible futures that we can totally evaluate. And I think part of the strategy is, well, one, acknowledging those limitations and being very clear about what we can and cannot do, what is tractable and the amount of time and with the resources we have, um, but also being very selective in terms of which examples we highlight, you know, which extremes we try to incorporate. And I think that's what part of David's slide was about, you know, stress testing the system, choosing the cases that will really provide a stress test um, and trying to push the model and the scenarios a little bit. Great, thank you so much. It is one o'clock, so I'm afraid that we are out of time. There were a number of wonderful questions that we weren't able to get to, um, but please feel free to reach Can out. Can we just get Majdi's response to that last question and then stop? Yeah, Majdi. Thanks, Adele. Very quickly, I just wanted to say that wicked problems, by definition, have no true or false answer. At best, you can get good or bad answer. Uh, so this ties very well with David and Rosa's uh, uh, answers and also goes back to, to uh, Chad's humility note that, uh, I mean, those problems really teach us more about humility and how, how, how to address solutions and live with this uncertainty. That, that, that was my quick answer to this. I'm glad that we got that. That was a perfect way to end. Thank you so much. And it is one o'clock, so we will have to go ahead and end the program. But um, please stay um, tuned for further work from this project. Um, and obviously, if you have questions for any of the participants, you're welcome to reach out to them directly. And thank you so much for joining us today.